Hello and welcome to part one of Northwest Newsweek Year in Review. I'm Riley McManus. Back in January, Sioux Lookout's mayor was cautiously optimistic after meeting with the Solicitor General about their sky-high policing costs. The municipalities of Sioux Lookout, Kenora and Pickle Lake formed a coalition in 2022 to collectively discuss reducing policing costs, claiming the three communities pay almost triple what other communities policed by the OPP are paying. Sioux Lookout's Mayor Doug Lawrence says the meeting with the Solicitor General Michael Kersner at the Roma conference went well. However, no concrete solution was decided by the end of the day. Lawrence says all parties agreed to continue talking over the coming months. And we have proposed various things, but it's up to them to come back with, with a proposal from uh, the Solicitor General's office. So that's what I hope they're working on. I believe they are. That's uh, over the next, uh, the coming weeks. He seems to be fully committed, uh, fully engaged, and uh, committed to, uh, to working with us and getting back and working with his staff and getting back to us within a matter of weeks uh, for further discussion. So I think that's a very positive signal. Lawrence hoped they'd be able to find a temporary solution first, and then over the longer term, the ministry will work through the process of renewing the Community Policing Safety Act. In early February, the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission backed off on a controversial proposal to merge two northwestern Ontario ridings. The proposal was widely panned by area residents and all three political parties, and it appears the commission listened. Ryan Benazzo reports. Area residents had some strong reaction to the Federal Electoral Commission's plan to merge two northwestern Ontario ridings ahead of the next federal election. We do not find much merit in what you have proposed. It is ludicrous. And now, according to a report tabled at the House of Commons today, the idea has been scrapped. They seem to listen to us. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy ab about that. Had the plan not been altered, the ridings of Thunder Bay Rainy River and Kenora would have merged. Liberal Marcus Pulowski and Conservative Eric Melillo may sit on opposite sides of the political aisle, but on this issue, they're united, saying it would have been tough for the remaining member to properly represent all of their constituents. Had we remained grouped in with Kenora, it would have resulted in 20,000 constituents like 500 kilometers away and it would have been hard to get over there and would be hard for them to talk to their MP. They really heard the concerns that were expressed uh, from people across uh, across our region and that they, uh, it looks like they, they made uh, every attempt to uh, to try to rectify that. Uh, of course, there's, uh, there's always going to be a bit of discussion about some of the specifics, but I think overall that they, they certainly uh, I uh, certainly got it right. Under the proposed boundaries, Melillo's riding will be renamed Kenora Kiwetanung, but it remains largely intact. Pulowski still notes there will be some northern representation lost in the legislature. It's good for the people of northwestern Ontario. Unfortunately, though, I can't say the same for the people of northern Ontario as a whole because northern Ontario has lost one seat, so I'm unhappy with that fact. That lost riding is in the Sault Ste. Marie area. Ryan Bonazzo, TBT News. Also in February, the community of Sioux Lookout was rallying to support dozens of seniors displaced by a major fire at the KDSB Seniors Housing Facility. The fire decimated one wing of the building, but some tenants managed to move back into the undamaged units. Lee Noonan reports. 11 units at the back of Patricia Plaza were destroyed in the February 4th fire, but officials say all 27 of the elderly tenants who were home at the time were evacuated without injury. People started banging on the walls saying, fire, get out, get out. We barely had time to get dressed. Just grab what you could. On Thursday, 11 tenants were moved back into the least damaged parts of the building, according to the KDSB. Many others, including Votary, have been able to return to collect their things. But for those in the units near the epicenter of the fire, that won't be possible. Yeah, there were seniors who didn't have insurance who lost everything. And so it, um, so I think as, as a collective, as, as a community, we were working hard to make sure that uh, when they move back home, that um, they won't be moving to an empty home. It's not one of those, uh, well, let's try to see if we can do this. They, they say we can promise that even if you don't have fire insurance or apartment insurance, they'll cover anything you need. Mayor Doug Lawrence says he's grateful to the citizens and organizations of Sioux Lookout who've stepped up 
to help out. And the community has responded uh, tremendously uh, to to the fire, whether it be uh, church groups or uh, individuals, businesses, agencies. Uh, it, it was a wonderful response. I knew that uh, as soon as this happened, it was right beside my office, literally, uh, that Nobody was going to have insurance or anything like that. And my wife and I decided probably about an hour, hour and a half after the fire to start the donations jar. Hoag says they've raised more than $2,500 so far and hope to see that number go a lot higher. The fire has been ruled non-suspicious and is believed to have been caused by an electrical issue. Wall says emergency systems worked well and the fire was limited to one wing of the building with only smoke or water damage in the remaining 26 units. A unit could cost about 300000 to rebuild, um, depending on the size. And so it's, you know, it, it could be anywhere two, three, four million. Like it's, so it's quite substantial. There is no firm timeline as to how long it may take to rebuild from the devastating fire. For now, everyone's just happy that residents were able to get out of the building safe and sound. Lee Noonan, TBT News. The deaths of three people, a couple and their young daughter, were confirmed in late February, following a devastating house fire in Pekanjikum First Nation. Kiwetanong MPP Sol Mamakwa addressed the tragedy at Queen's Park. Bernie Turtle, 44. Kristen Moose, 38. And Kendriana Turtle, 8. The three victims were survived by a teenage girl who escaped the blaze. According to a statement from the First Nation, Pekanchikum peacekeepers were unable to douse the flames, saying that without an adequate building to warm the community's two fire trucks, the cold weather caused mechanical issues with both vehicles. Chief Shirley Lynn Keeper called the government's response unacceptable, saying, quote, We have never felt so hopeless. Our ability to fight structural fires has not improved since 2016. A family of nine died in a fire in March of that year. I was there on Saturday. The house was still smoldering. After three days, Speaker, because they do not have the capacity to put the fire out. This government needs to commit to a fire hall for Pekanjika so this does not happen again. I have suggested that in certain instances, if there's an existing fire hall, Mr. Speaker, we would be provide we would be prepared to support that, but we can't do this in every single community without the full cooperation of the federal government. And I think we acknowledge here today, Mr. Speaker, that fire response, the capacity in, on reserve, Mr. Speaker, is something that remains a challenge for the federal government. In a written statement, a spokesperson for Federal Minister Patty Haidu called the number of fires and deaths from fires on reserve quote, absolutely unacceptable, adding that the minister's office was planning a fire safety gathering in the coming weeks. Nishnabi ASCII Grand Chief Derek Fox was responding to his sudden suspension by the NAN Executive Council in early March, and he called for a snap election by the 49 chiefs for a potential show of confidence in his leadership. Very few details were released on the reasons for Fox's suspension. NAN would only confirm that an internal investigation was launched due to alleged violations of the NAN Executive Council Code of Conduct. The Executive Council includes the three Deputy Grand Chiefs. On social media, Fox released a statement saying, quote, I have been wrongfully and possibly defamed by statements that are untrue. I've asked the NAN Chiefs to call for an election of the entire executive. I propose an election be held in the next 60 to 90 days. The future of NAN is critically important and we can't be distracted from this. I trust the Chiefs to resolve this. Fox was elected Grand Chief in August of 2021. NAN officials rejected his proposal and Fox was officially removed from his post in May. Coming up after the break, we'll bring you the story of a fatal plane crash north of Makina.
In late February, a Cessna plane operated by ZAM Air Services disappeared north of Nikina, with two crew members on board. The tragic discovery of the wreckage came nearly a week later. Jonathan Wilson reports. The missing plane owned by ZAM Air, formerly known as Nikina Air Services, was bringing cargo to Edmonton First Nation on February 28th when it failed to arrive at the airport at Fort Hope. After a five-day search by more than half a dozen aircraft and search teams, the crew on this civil air search and rescue plane spotted a darker area in the forest below at around 11.30 Saturday morning. We were simply flying up the track and uh, suddenly uh, we heard from one of the other members of the crew to turn hard right. Uh, we broke the aircraft hard right, came around. Uh, we lost it immediately and then uh, after a couple more turns we were able to locate the search object, uh, mark, mark it and then uh, relay the coordinates to our other SAR partners who were on scene literally in a matter of a few minutes. Did you see a, pl a wing? What was sticking out, the whole plane or maybe just a wing? What did you see? Uh, not very much, a little bit of scorched ground and that, that was about it. The plane crashed approximately one third of the way along its flight to Fort Hope, just south of Chaucer Lake, about 60 kilometers northwest of Nikina. Major Emmanuel Graton, an Air Force commander involved in the search, says their Griffin helicopter couldn't land near the crash site, so a hoist was used to lower two Air Force search and rescue technicians to the ground. So we inserted the two uh, search and rescue technicians and unfortunately when they arrived on scene uh, both uh, occupants were found uh, without vital signs. And when we come upon a crash scene and, and there are no survivors it's, it's not good. We're, we're glad maybe we can bring closure to the family but at the same time uh, it, it's tough. It's tough for everybody. Yeah. Breton says the families of the two deceased crew members were notified soon after. The identities have not been released, but sources indicate the two men were from the Thunder Bay area. The rescue effort was hampered by the densely forested terrain, the large search area, and the lack of an emergency transmitter signal from the plane. The search involved two Hercules aircraft, helicopters from the Air Force, Coast Guard, OPP and MNR, and two civilian search planes operated by Casera. Members from Edmonton First Nation also helped search for the crash site using snowmobiles. I really appreciate everyone's efforts. It, it was uh, definitely a big team that uh, coordinated this event and uh, we're really happy with all the support we received from the local uh, community and the, all the different uh, resources. The OPP are now in charge of transporting the victims from the crash site and the Transportation Safety Board is sending investigators to the scene to try to determine the cause. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. The chief of Niskandika First Nation declared in March that he and his members were willing to lay down their lives in order to stop the development of mining roads into the Ring of Fire. The strong message from Chief Wayne Munias came one day after the Ford government approved the terms of reference for the proposed northern road link. We will fight and we, will, we are determined to protect our, our way of life, our rights, and uh, this is a message to all the investors. If you want to come and do business in our, in our traditional homelands, you have to get the free prior for consent of our people. That is it. The day before, Mining Minister George Peary was joined by Webaque Chief Cornelius Wabas and Martin Falls Chief Bruce Achney Pinescom for the road link announcement. The two communities are leading the environmental assessment for the new corridor, which would connect the proposed Martin Falls Access Road and Webaque Supply Road to future mines. Niskandika has been a vocal opponent to developing the Ring of Fire. Munia says the road and the mines will have a negative impact on the Attawapiskat River, which he calls the lifeblood of his community. This is unacceptable. This is something that's very concerning for us, and that's something that uh, the seal of Ring of Fire Metals needs to know you that you're not going to cross our river system without our free of prior informed consent. You're going to have to kill us. You're going to have to do more than just getting access from the province of Ontario. Ring of Fire Metal CEO Kristen Straub responded saying, quote, Niskandika First Nation is an important community to us, and we continue to extend an invitation to Chief Munias. We are committed to listening to the views and aspirations of all communities and to be making balanced decisions about future development in the Ring of Fire. A winter storm that slammed the region in mid-March led to numerous highway closures, including one fatal crash just west of Ignace. Dryden OPP said a snowplow operator died after his vehicle collided with a tractor trailer. The victim was a 75-year-old Ignace resident. Meanwhile, another transport crashed into a pair of houses in Beardmore. 
Greenstone OPP said fortunately there were no injuries reported to the people living within the residences. However, the two occupants of the transport were taken to the Nipigon District Hospital with undetermined injuries. The accident happened at around 1 a.m. along Highway 11 in Beardmore, which is a 50 km an hour zone. The transport driver, a 24-year-old man from Brampton, was later charged with careless driving. It was a big day on March 17th for Biktagon Nishnabek, also known as Pick River First Nation. The community signed a community benefits agreement with the planned generation mining palladium mine located nine kilometers away from the edge of their territory. Minister Patty Haidu also confirmed a major funding announcement that day. The community is getting $62 million from Ottawa. Four million of that is for a new cultural centre, while the majority of the money is for construction of a new water intake and water treatment plant. We will be moving forward with the funding of a new uh, raw water intake and a plant for Bitagong. It's uh, about a $58 million project. It'll be the stability that the community needs for the years to come. The announcements were made in a virtual gathering which included a traditional First Nation ceremony. Officials from Generation Mining had been working with the First Nation on a community benefits agreement that will see Bictagon companies receive revenue from the future mining operation. Chief Duncan Mishano stresses that diversifying sources of funding is an important part of ensuring the community retains their independence from external entities. The CBA basically will provide us with some of that money. It's not uh, in all, but it will provide us with a, a substantial amount to help us move towards that, those uh, objectives and those goals that we want to do in the long run. The mine completed the permitting phase in the fall. Meanwhile, construction on the water treatment facility is well underway, and the project is expected to be completed by the end of 2024. Time now for another short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the story of the battle between Scriber and Terrace Bay for a new EMS base. Welcome back to Northwest Newsweek Year in Review. In April, the fight was on between Terrace Bay and Scriber, each hoping to make the case that their community is the better location for a new EMS station. The Chief of Superior North EMS was in Terrace Bay to consult with local stakeholders on the amalgamation of the two existing EMS stations. Lee Noonan reports. 
Harris Bay has the hospital, a bigger population, and higher call volume, which Mayor Paul Malaszewski says makes his town the right choice, while Scriber Mayor Kevin Mullins feels that the township's more central location makes it the better location for them and communities to the west. Well, I think all, all, everyone on council and administration are going to fight hard to have that, uh, the ambulance stay in Terrace Bay. I really believe the region would be better with the, the ambulance being centralized in Scriber. The new EMS station will house the same number of ambulances and paramedics that are currently stationed between the two communities, allowing the EMS service to stagger its shifts in a way that increases the time paramedics are on site and reduces average wait times, according to Superior North EMS Chief Shane Muir. They get that response uh, notification that there's a 911 call. They can walk down, jump into the ambulance right away, have quick rising doors and be out and uh, responding to that call within 90 seconds. Muir does admit that while response times should be faster overall, they would be slower in some cases, something neither mayor wants. Well, we're looking after the, uh, the interests of our community, so yeah, obviously he wants it in Scriber and uh, we want it in Terrace Bay. Muir also hopes the new schedule will help avoid burnout and that a new station with modern working and living quarters will help address the service's difficulties with recruitment and retention in the area. It's a big draw for paramedics. Uh, they can come in, they can use their skills and use modern equipment and work in great communities where the people are really pleasurable and um, they'll be excited to be here. Muir also talked about increasing paramedicine work in the communities and a new dispatch system that's expected to improve the prioritization of 911 calls. The power structure of Superior North EMS was also a major discussion point, with some expressing dismay that Thunder Bay City Council had the authority to amalgamate district EMS stations in the first place. It's too bad that it came down to, uh, to this, but... Um, Thunder Bay has made a decision and uh, Shane's going to abide by it. Muir wants to have a site selected quickly and shovels in the ground this year if possible. And both communities are ready with several suggestions for possible locations. Meanwhile, a site selection process is also underway in Nipigon Red Rock. Lee Noonan, TBT News. In late April, there was a devastating collision on the highway outside of Dryden. The victims were identified as two youth, Callie and Evan Joseph of Shoal Lake, 39. The siblings were traveling to Thunder Bay with their parents, who survived the crash. Once again, here's Lee Noonan. Both Callie and Evan Joseph were avid minor hockey players, and there's been a massive outpouring of support and of grief from the hockey community around the region. The family of four was traveling to Thunder Bay for the Battle on the Bay Hockey Tournament, which took place this weekend at the Fort William First Nation Arena. The A Division champs, the Washups, posed for a photo with Callie's team, the Shoal Lake Flyers, and her number 23 jersey. They pledged to donate their entire $2,000 tournament prize money to the Josephs. Several other teams also donated their winnings. Meanwhile, a GoFundMe campaign has been set up to raise funds to support the family in the aftermath of this devastating loss. The campaign exceeded its $35,000 goals in less than a day, with donations still coming in. OPP are continuing to investigate the three-vehicle crash and ask anyone with information to come forward. Lee Noonan, TBT News. A young Terrace Bay boy was badly mauled by his family's Rottweilers in April. For weeks, the boy slowly recovered from his injuries, and the six dogs involved in the attack were put down. Six-year-old Bentley Larrabee was cared for in a London, Ontario hospital. He suffered a broken arm, a slight vertebrae fracture, and multiple deep flesh wounds that required skin grafts. The horrifying incident occurred on April 15th in the family's backyard. Terrace Bay resident Sylvain Tessier heard the screams and jumped over a fence to help the mother save Bentley and his little brother Oakley from the Rottweiler attack. Their mother said Bentley's recovery was progressing well and Oakley's injuries were much less severe. Tessier set up a GoFundMe for the boys and it easily surpassed its $10,000 goal. The incident prompted Terrace Bay officials to look at changing their bylaws to limit the number of dogs allowed in a household. 
And that wraps up part one of Northwest Newsweek Year in Review. Join us next time for part two, covering the months of May until August and featuring more of the top stories from around the region.